For the price of a cup of coffee, join my Patreon. The page includes audio documentaries not available on my YouTube channel. Link below in the description. Thanks for watching. Through his childhood, John Lennon was raised by his aunt Mimi, who was basically his mother. When John was awarded an MBE by the Queen, he gave it to Mimi, stating, You deserve it more than I do. Mimi kept the MBE on her TV set next to a picture of John. On her wall, she hung a picture of John's son Julian, along with a plaque John made her. It quoted a phrase she would repeat to John every day when he was young. For many years, John tried to buy Mimi another house in a more desirable area of England. Mimi refused to move from her home in Liverpool, stating, Why should I? I spent hundreds on it. John gave up after two years, but when the other Beatles' parents had accepted houses as gifts, he became more determined than ever. One time while they were having breakfast, John announced, OK, I'm going to find you a house. Where would you like it? Just to shut him up, Mimi said Bournemouth. John then phoned his chauffeur and told him, We'll be leaving for Bournemouth today. John and Mimi were driven to Bournemouth that day and looked through a list of houses with an estate agent. Mimi warmed to the idea, but was adamant she wanted a house by the sea. But unfortunately, there wasn't one. As they were about to leave, the agent remembered there was one that had just come up. A small white house in sandbanks by Paul Harbour. Most of the properties built on sandbanks were single stories, because it was very difficult to build on sand. Building techniques have changed since that time. A viewing was booked, but Mimi didn't want to go in with John dressed the way he was. John was wearing old jeans with holes in them, an old suede jacket, which Mimi had bought him years before, which was miles too small for him, and a yachting hat he'd taken to wearing. As he'd done all through his childhood, he ignored Mimi, and the two were driven over to see the house. On arrival, John marched into the house saying, How do you do? Mind if I look around? The couple who answered the door was starstruck and just stared at John for the whole time. Mimi inspected the woodwork, which she felt needed repainting, and John looked around the grounds to see if the house was overlooked or if anyone could build nearby. John then asked, Do you like it, Mimi? If you don't, I'll have it. Mimi, still not in the best of moods, stated, It'll do. In the following years, John had a balcony built with wrought iron railings. They were crafted in the shape of hearts to show his love for his aunt. After John's death, Mimi was furious to learn John had never transferred ownership to her and Yoko Ono owned the property. Still, Mimi lived in the bungalow right up until her death in 1991. She was 85 years old. The day Mimi was cremated, Yoko Ono put the property up for sale. The bungalow was sold on and later bulldozed to the ground by a property tycoon. In its place stands a ridiculous modern glass structure. The property was put back on the market and the estate agents claimed, it's a chance to own a bit of rock and roll history. John Lennon visited his aunt here a lot, though this house is about as rock and roll as a Starbucks coffee shop. And the place John Lennon visited was a traditional English build. Any connection with John Lennon and this property was bulldozed to the ground and thrown into a skip back in 1994. The happiest day of Jim McCartney's life came in 1964 when Paul told him he could give up work. He was 62, had worked since he was 14 and had another three years left. Paul bought him a detached house in Cheshire. Central heating was installed and a complete refurbishment of the property. 
two part-time gardeners were hired to maintain the grounds. On Jim's 62nd birthday, Paul took him to Dorchester where the Beatles' Hard Day's Night film premiere party was being held. There he handed him a parcel to open and when he did, he saw a picture of a horse. He looked at it in confusion thinking, what the hell do I want a picture of a horse for? Paul could tell by the look on his face he didn't understand and said, It's not just a picture, I've bought you the bloody horse, it's yours, and it's running at Cheshire on Saturday. Paul set him up a finance account, which, for the rest of his life, he could take any amount of money he wanted. When Jim died in 1976, John Lennon was one of the first people to hear the news. He phoned Paul to tell him. Of all the Beatles' parents' houses purchased for them, the Harrisons was the most isolated and hard to find. It was an L-shaped bungalow with three acres of land in Cheshire. Unlike the other Beatles' homes, not many gold discs or Beatles' memorabilia could be found on the property walls. George's parents were the kindest and most welcoming to fans and maybe that's why their bungalow was filled with items gifted to them by the group's loyal following. George's mum Louise spent her days answering fan mail, staying up until 2am replying to letters, an average of 200 a week, and not just a few words, each would have about two pages of writing. Louise once stated, I've always personally answered all letters, she also signed over 2,000 photographs a month she collected from the fan club headquarters in Liverpool. Despite this, it became impossible to reply to them all. In 1965, George's dad Harold gave up work after 31 years driving buses. George had asked him what his salary was, and when he answered, George stated, I'll give you three times that to do nothing. It will put another 10 years on your life. Of all the Beatles, George was the only one to grow up with both his parents. Louise died in 1970 with George chanting Harry Krishna by her side. Harold Harrison died eight years later and George again sat by his bed chanting, wishing him a safe trip to heaven. Ringo's father saw very little of him since he split from his mother. Ringo was his only son and he lived his later life in crew working as a baker. During the rise of the Beatles fame, fans asked him if he was any relation to Ringo, he would tell them he was his uncle. He never reconciled with Ringo and died in 1981. He never tried to cash in on his son's success and there were no photos of Ringo found in his home, just a signed photo of the Beatles. He once stated, He's done well the lad and good luck to him, but he owes me nothing. Ringo was very close with his stepfather Harry Graves who he affectionately nicknamed Step Ladder. He bought Harry and his mum Elsie a luxury bungalow in Walton, Liverpool. They were the only Beatles parents who remained in Liverpool. Gold discs and Beatles records lined the walls. Ringo's stepfather once stated, I think I prefer their earlier music best. Harry was able to quit his job as a paint and decorator in 1965 at the age of 51. He stated, I could have done another 14 years if I wanted to. Harry and Elsie were the last Beatles parents to move home. They had resisted since they liked their neighbours so much. Eventually, the fans became too much and they had no choice. They had a dislike for the press more than any other Beatles parents. Elsie was no fan of signing autographs either. Elsie died in 1986 after battling leukemia. She was 47 years old. Harry died in 1994 at the age of 87. Ringo later stated, 
My stepdad was the best man in the world. I loved him. He was my dad.